stories about water and urban places, this is ID Anthro. Hey everyone, and welcome back to ID Anthro. And more specifically, welcome back to season one of Front of Mind, where we nab ourselves one, or in this case two, guests from our stormwater, water sensitive urban design industry and ask them what's on their mind, what is fascinating them, interesting them, you know, puzzling them at the moment in this space. As I say, today we have two guests and I'll come to both of them in a second. But the context of this discussion is some recent research into how much pollution and what type of pollution comes off urban catchments. And as will become clear throughout this conversation, that recent research sort of shakes up what we previously thought was going on here and could have some profound implications for what we know of, how much pollution is coming off, how we size stormwater treatment systems and things of that nature. So that's the context of the conversation. We're going to have to build into this with a little bit of context about research. So to get us going, our two guests are Darren, Darren Drapper, who has extensive experience in the stormwater testing, stormwater treatment, research of you know, how much pollution comes off catchments and the like over what, 20 odd years? 20 odd. Is that fair? Yep. yep. And now works as an independent consultant. Mm -hmm. And we have Andy Hornbuckle, who comes to our stormwater industry from a business background, but is now, I suppose, the driving force behind Spell, who are one of the proprietary treatment device manufacturers, behind Spell's testing program of their devices. And the reason that's significant will become apparent as we get into this. So, welcome both of you. One more thing before we get in, we're going to talk about a paper that you both published recently, and of course your co-author on that was Terry Lukey Absolutely. for the Uni of Sunshine Coast. Mm. Context done, let's get into this. Darren, can you give us an introduction to this research, and then we'll talk about what it's found. Sure, thanks Jack for the opportunity. Um, the interesting thing about this was that we never set out to, um, to actually reach this conclusion from the beginning. It was uh, a program that um, Andy's engaged us to project manage in terms of monitoring their treatment devices in the field. And as we're going through that, um, we're starting to get some interesting data that came out that showed that the pollutants coming into the devices from the catchments were all quite low. In fact, low compared to the context that we knew from the Brisbane City Council studies and the water by design and um, the music modeling guidelines, all those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. That started to um, flick a few triggers and we said, all right, between Terry and myself, Terry being one of our peer reviewers or academic reviewers, um, starting to say, all right, well, one, is the, the catchments or are these catchments representative? Yeah. So you've got something different, yeah. different to what you'd expect. Yeah. Is it just a weird one-off case or is there a reason? That's right. Yep. So we started to go a little bit wider and we started to look at other research that had been done in the intervening period between Brisbane City Council's monitoring data, which is about 2004, -ish. Yep. Um, and where we are now, sort of 2016, 2017, is when we start to gather some information together. Mm -hmm. So we, we brought together uh, Isri Mangankas data from Kuma Waters and Lou's data from BirdLife Park um, in Highland Park down in the rain, mm -hmm. um, and some additional catchments from um, Terry's work up on the Sunshine Coast. So basically, and to, to put it in context, the information from Andy's sites is only 50% of the data that goes into this paper. Sure. And when we pushed that all together, we found that um, the, the pollutant concentrations coming off those sites now is significantly different to what was reported and what's in all their guidelines. Yeah, and this is, now it's not the case that the BCC work wasn't undertaken on the same catchments as this, no. but it's catchments that are you know, Brisbane City Council sort of working in South East Queensland, obviously, and this work is also in South East Queensland. Right. But there are different catchments, and yeah. that's yes. important. That's right, yeah, that's right. So, um, to be clear, Brisbane City Council catchments were um, large catchments, 15, 20, up to hundreds of hectares. Yeah. Um, where most of these catchments we're looking at a, a lot scale. So, under 10 hectares, 7 hectares is probably the largest one. Yeah, and is it fair to say the BCC data was to some extent mixed uses within the catchments correct and these are typically smaller sites because typically you're testing a, a treatment device yeah. on them yeah. of only one land use so it's like yeah. very clear this yeah. is commercial yeah. versus this might be like 80 percent rares with a bit of commercial and some parks yeah. and yeah yeah okay yeah yeah so there's obviously those difference of scale um difference of 
of clarity around the land use. Um, so there's certainly some, some questions that um, uh, it makes it difficult to, to sort of directly compare the two sets of data. Um, however, we're, we're using and we're applying this information on those catchments now. Um, we're using those guidelines to model our music models yes. and to get development approvals. Yes. So, so we're taking data developed from, say, a larger mixed catchment yep. to say how much pollution might be coming off a two hectare commercial yep. development yep. or yep. something like that. Yep. Or even yep. down to a 2,050 square metre channel. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. So, um, so that was, as I say, it wasn't our goal when we started the process to actually challenge where we were coming from. It was more a case of, well, well this is the data that's coming through and it, it's not matching up, it's not yep. narrowing up. Is, is it worth going to it? Is it worth touching on like one very good reason why you weren't looking out to looking to find profoundly different data here, which is yeah. to say, as a manufacturer, these numbers are actually a little on the awkward side. Absolutely. Andy? Yeah. Because tell me, like you're testing against certain protocols. Yeah. Do these numbers fit within those protocols? <laughs> it's a good question. So at the end of the day, when we've embarked on this, what councils have been asking me for years to produce field tests of data. So we had to go out in the field and do that, which we now are doing across nine sites, essentially. Dif different sites and some different land uses and, and different products. Um, I, I guess, and all I was wanting to know is, with whatever's coming in off that catchment, and what is coming out of my device, what is the performance of that device? Yeah. So I could get the university to give me an independent report, we can get it published in a peer-reviewed journal and take it back to the councils. Um, and it's been an incredible four, nearly five year journey that we've collected this data over. Um, and the, the, the difficult thing for us, Jack, is that obviously with less pollution coming in, it makes it more difficult for that treatment device, be it a proprietary device or a bioretention system, yep. to actually achieve your 80, 60, 45 common yep. reductions that are required. Yeah, and so this is the funny thing. So the, the protocols that have been developed across the nation, there's different ones out there and stuff going to fruition. Typically, and the Gold Coast one's an example of this, sets a range that says, look, when you're picking a site, the pollutant concentration should be within this range. And that's particularly important because if the concentrations are higher, Absolutely. devices will find it particularly easy yep. to treat that water. Yep. If you're taking a high concentration to a moderate concentration, not moderate to low. Yeah. But in this instance, you've picked, accidentally picked up sites that have lower concentrations than the bottom range of those guidelines. Yeah. Which actually is both awkward for you because you're struggling to comply with the standard, but would not work in your favour in terms of showing how marvellous your devices are treating, because they actually have to work a lot harder to clean up already quite clean water. Yeah. Okay. I and, want, I want and, and, and further to that, um, the the to, to hone in on nitrogen, um, we're seeing that it's sixty percent of it is organic. Yes. And this is not just on resi, and not just on commercial. It's it's on both those types of catchments on those smaller catchments it may be we don't know but it may be that because of the other the previous data that the industry is using is on bigger mixed-use catchments there may be a lot more dilution of the organic matter coming off those bigger catchments where because we're testing a smaller concentrated area representative of where these treatment devices are really going um, in intensive urban development um, that we're seeing these different results yeah and from a manufacturer's perspective, um, it could be a bad thing for us in the sense that because we're seeing a lot less pollutant come off, we could be selling a lot less product. Yeah, so, someone's going to ask the questions because it's, it is showing a fair lot less pollution coming off. Mm. The, a relevant question is, <laughs> why are we treating this? Like, yeah. Or why are we treating it to that standard? Or yeah. That's yeah. relevant question. Okay, so let's just back up once. So that's good context. So I just wanted to, I wanted to, to add to that. Yeah, um, as we're collecting this information, uh, we're looking at it and going, well, it is confirming the pollutant concentrations coming off our catchments are so mm. much less. Yeah. Mm. And, and obviously that has a, a business flow on. 
Um, yeah, Darren, Darren combined the data sets and brought it to me and said, look, look at these outcomes. And I did sit on it for a few months thinking, wow, like this is significant, this yeah. is breakthrough. But the thing that I came to is, is at the end of the day, when it comes down to science and the environment, which is what we're ultimately here for, uh, and not everyone is, but some of us are. And like, I just wanted to get it out there because the more we, like I like using the analogy of we're climbing inside a black box and it's sealed and you don't know what's going on in there. Well, and you get in, you screw in a light bulb and you turn it on in one corner and what have you found? Well, that's what we've done. We've just put on a light bulb in one corner of this. You know what's funny? I used that analogy the other day and I thought that was my original analogy, but I think you've told me that before and I've pinched it and used <laughs> oh, no, it. No, no, I'll tell you where the analogy comes from. It comes from Jim Collins, good, okay. to, good to great. Oh, that's and I have read from. that book as well. Yeah. Huh, that's yeah. funny. Okay, yeah. so let's just back up. So so we got the context of like mm. how the start is a little awkward, but why it's also important to get out there. Mm. Can we just nut down really quickly? Well, actually, it doesn't have to be quick. But in a bit more detailing, exactly what does it show mm. is different. Yep. In yeah. terms of so it's in terms of the concentrations <laughs> of the pollutants, but also in terms of the fractions. So within yeah. say nitrogen, yeah. the types of nitrogen. Can you yeah. sure. dig into that, Darren? So um, probably to to keep it relatively simple, um, the suspended solids concentrations. Um, we usually accept, expect to see them around that 100, 150 milligrams per liter. Mm -hmm. What we're seeing is that is about 60% less. Okay. So um, it's a fairly significant drop um, in terms of, of what we're seeing from the suspended solids. In terms of, of nitrogen in particular, not only is it less, but as Andy mentioned before, we're looking at predominantly organic nitrogen. So a, a TKN form or a, an ammonium form, mm -hmm. not a nitrate form which we expected before, we saw in the previous data, and all of our guidelines and our, our previous papers have, have pushed us down the path of treatment systems that target nitrate. Yeah, so a bioretention or something like that nature. Retention, wetlands. Like better at that. Yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. something, yeah, whereas, yeah, organic nitrogen. But is it fair to say that a spell system fine, relative to a bioretention? might find it easy to pull out organic nitrogen. From a then, spell storm sack perspective, okay. so putting catch basin inserts yep. into pits, in which, pits. Yep. which are relatively inexpensive, and they're relatively inexpensive to maintain, as opposed to a big end of line GPT system. So this is a thing that I weighed up, is that in one sense, this information could be good for the developers in the industry, because they could be putting in smaller treatment systems, um, but on the other hand, um, it could be bad in the sense that we don't get to sell the volume of equipment that we sell now. Yeah, it might cause a shift from one of your products to another. To another. Yeah. And the same for the other yeah. manufacturers, because you're yeah. obviously not the only people Absolutely. who sell yeah. gully baskets for that, yeah, yeah, yeah. For that matter. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But I think it's just good to get it all out there, keep start a conversation, Keep it moving. Well, data is so just keep improving the environment. So hard and expensive to come across here. Yeah, expensive. Actually, the reason it's hard, to be honest. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And I think the, um, the 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 logical conclusion is that oh well, that because Spell's funding part of this, that um, it's interesting that the data produces organic results that they can they can capture. The organic result might be beneficial, but the concentration result is no, 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 no. pointing in your no, favour. No. So. And I, I think the, but can I just the extension, in there? we no, have managed to hit the 80-60-45 with those low concentrations. <laughs> nice little plug there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but sure. I, I think the um, one of the conclusions of the paper is also that this is not about saying that, that natural systems and biotension systems and wetlands don't have a place because um, all we're looking at really is, is that small part, the, the upper part of the catchment. Mm. Um, we think there's still a need to explore the bigger catchments, and that might be the place where the, the biotension systems and the natural systems have that nitrate to treat. It's transformed as it goes down the pipe. So yep. that's an area that, that yeah, what went on this way. And this ties in really nice to the question that I want to ask, which is along the lines of. Does this feel to you like it's research that says either A, we've once thought something but it was wrong and we now know that this supersedes it, or is it a case more like the black box analogy where like the previous research had lit up 
a little corner of the box yeah. and this has lit another corner of the yeah. box mm. and it's what it's actually showing just how much variability and yeah. how much we don't know mm. rather yeah. than telling us everything that we do know which is absolutely is it yeah. b is it the yeah second? it's b yeah. Yeah. yeah we don't know everything yeah. there's more research to be done yeah and and i think that, that that's probably one of the things that we threw around as the, the paper has been reviewed and, and then published that um i don't think the outcome that we want to see is the music guidelines thrown out and ignored and no way no. I, I think what we probably or what no to be true i think what we're looking at is um potentially an addition to those guidelines that says well once you're down below five degrees and you know what's going on in the attachment this is the information you use when you're above five degrees this is the information you use so i think it's a supplement to that not the replacement yeah you know, yeah five hectares is a pretty big number darren like um how many of our sites in that paper are at five hectares two two of them yeah what's uh okay so to start I know we won't have a definitive answer to this by any means, but to start to think about why these sites might be different, we sort of alluded to it in a couple of points here, but what do you think the options might be for why the BCC type sites deliver different results to these? Like, is, and, and options might be have time and have practices changed over time, or is the size of the sites, or Type of cat, like what what things could possibly spring to mind that might explain why these sites are different? And I know we can't answer. Yeah. Why? But yeah. what might be if someone wanted to think about that and investigate yeah. that? Well, I think there's climate change. So we've certainly had uh, change in monitoring patterns. Okay. Um, I think in terms of management practices, um, 15 years ago I could go buy a bag of tropic, big 20 kilo bag of tropic and fertilize my lawn. Uh, I can't find the same dissolved soluble fertilizer in uh, hardware stores. So um, I think there's been an education change there that um, if you do food fertilizing with lawns, use more an organic based fertilizer. Uh, in terms of the practices, maybe we are turning our streets to that. Maybe the councils have got a better fleet out there to do that. Um, you know, this begs a question that would be fascinating. It would be for someone to go back to the original BCC sites yes. now and monitor them. That's See whether those sites have changed. That's yeah. what needs to happen because we're comparing data of different catchments. Yeah. And it's very lot scale as opposed to their... So we're looking at a totally different land use. Yeah, we need to be able to control for the potential change of practice over time. And that's yeah. really going back to those original patterns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Good luck getting the funding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like it's, it's a valid question. So this really ties into the last question I want to ask, which is, where should this research go next? Or, or actually not just research practice. So you touched a little bit, in a practical sense, it would be good if this could be implemented into using more of the guidelines. What else would you like to see in either practice or research happen you know, in the next, don't say, year or two in this space? The short term, I, I think, as you say, that you need to go back to those original catchments that were tested, um, and test them again. Um, you can't ever replicate the rain events and climatic conditions. So it's, it's never going to be a perfect comparison, but certainly I think that is one area that, that needs to be done. Um, the other option is when we look at those catchments that are a part of this um, this research and go further downstream, see if there's a point at which that organic nitrogen swings back to... Oh, well, that's the other way you can drill that, can't you? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. So they're yeah. the two, two thoughts I've had. Yeah, I like it. Cool. Well, thank you both for your time chatting about this. Any final thoughts from either of you? If we sum this up pretty nicely. Cool. I don't think so. It's good. Like I'm I really appreciate it because for me this does feel like a profound and important bit of data and hard to hard to get data. So yeah. um yeah I, I appreciate you both and Terry as well for putting yeah. it out there. So yeah. You can look at it and consider it and you know someone else can get in and take the next step and 
But yeah, the interesting thing that I probably finish with is the week that we published the paper actually physically had it published. Um, Department of Science, InfoTech and Innovation published their statewide water quality monitoring program. Right. Um, and their results for storm events are showing pretty much the same as what we've just published. So, um, disappointing that we didn't have that data beforehand to include it, but um, um, I suppose it's encouraging. It's not just us and it's not just our data. Yeah. The state's now presenting publicly they're finding the same sorts of things. So, yeah. I'll have to go take a look because I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, so. yeah. Cool. It's about 300 pages, so enjoy it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and but that's no, my reading um, list. It's really important to get it out there so people can have these conversations, think about it, reflect on it, and then eventually some good will come out of it. Yeah. And someone somewhere will act on it and be able to use it for further science. Yeah, that's exactly it. Progress one little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. Just, just, cool. On yes. just on the expenses, just on the expenses. When I average it out, it's about a hundred grand per site per year. Okay. If you, once you get your initial capital cost, and then start spreading it over like a four-year program, sure. it averages out about a hundred grand per year per site. So if you want to go back and test all those Brisbane ones, there's your budget. That's where we need to start. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Cool. Well, thank you both for taking the time to have a chat. I really yeah. appreciate it. And thank you for tuning in and considering this data. Really appreciate that as well. Thank Have you. a good one. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Before you go, our best episodes come from your questions. This knowledge base, these discussions that our idea intro improve with your contribution. So if there's a topic, an idea, a concept that you would like us to explore, come and ask us. You know where to find us www.onlyanthro.com slash contact. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and that place you get your good podcasts from. You know where to find us. We look forward to hearing from you. We'll see you soon.